Well, good morning, everybody. Everybody just looks happy and joyful this morning. It's been a great service up to this point. Like Terry said earlier, I always appreciate the praise and the uh, the songs. They sing Do It Again Today, which is becoming one of my favorites. I, you know, I go for weeks where I have a favorite that I seem to be singing along to in the car quite often, and that's one of those. So always great to gather and to worship together. Turn your Bibles over to the book of Hebrews. We're going to be in chapter 6 again this morning, and we're going to continue our series and finish it today called Anchored, Enduring Faith. Uh, we're taking our theme from Hebrews chapter 6 at verse 19 where we're reminded that we have this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. What we want is anchored faith, enduring faith, strong faith, built upon a solid foundation. And what I've been doing over the course of the past several weeks is introducing several characters that the Hebrew writer seems to address, and we're going to have one more character today that I'll introduce in a few moments. But on our first Sunday morning, uh, we introduced Drifter from Hebrews chapter 2, Uh, the one who is in danger of, because of neglect, perhaps because of an increasing apathy, or just a tired faith having lived long in it, Drifter was in danger of just drifting away, slowly moving away from that strong faith that he or she had initially at their conversion. And then last Sunday morning we looked at Defiant, whose heart was hardened who had come to a place in his or her spiritual life where they were ready to throw in the towel and perhaps had done so, and had come to a place where they said, I I no longer want anything to do with what's happening up there at the church and with all that talk about Jesus, and they've returned back to their former life. Well, our character today is a character that I'm going to call dragging. Dragging was once a pillar of spiritual zeal, having been brought to Christ by a friend in his young adult years. He was convinced that he and his group of enthusiastic Christians could bring the world to Christ after his baptism. He was on fire. But in more recent years, dragging had succumbed to a slow fade into spiritual Lethargy, the fervor and the dedication that once defined his faith journey had given way to a kind of mild apathy and neglect of practices that he once was accused of devoting far too much time to. Things like prayer and time in the Word. And he'd once been so busy in the work of God that he felt like he might just need some rest and renewal. And so he was coming to a place where he felt like he might be, to use a term that's modern and not in Scripture, burning out. And for him, what was intended to be just a period of kind of stepping back from so much involvement in the life of the church and seeing others step in, that turned into a phase where it was easier for a lengthy period of time to sit on the sidelines rather than to be out on the playing field of service. Uh, He was partly tired and partly discouraged because the newness had worn off. And he hadn't always experienced the dynamic results that he thought he would see in his youthful zeal, that he was sure would ultimately come. That through his life, scores of people would come to Christ. The world would be turned upside down. And then, as he got older, life's increasing demands and some personal disappointments in other Christians had gradually eroded his once unwavering commitment to spiritual practices and to fellowship in his church community. Dragging's Bible often remained unopened except for a brief spell during the sermon on Sunday morning. Prayers were far less frequent. And gathering with his church family felt a little bit more like a habit and a routine rather than an event that he looked forward to week after week. And his descent into spiritual listlessness was not just a product of busyness and disillusionment, he also now had a sense of isolation within the church community that was deepening. 
the absence of others in his life left him feeling isolated and without the encouragement of other people, he found this gap between himself and God widening. He had enough belief that he would never think of just quitting, but there were certainly no fire, no great depth of conviction, little involvement. Despite his spiritual slump, there was a little spark of desire within him to experience a renewal that seemed to be ever-present. There was that ember of hope that hinted at the possibility, perhaps, of rekindling his passion, of fanning again the flame of that fire into a, to a roar. He still believed. And even though he didn't deal with any great resentment or anger toward anyone or toward the Christian faith, he still felt just kind of spiritually lazy and listless. And he longed for the zeal and the vibrancy that he had once experienced to return. Unlike Drifter, uh, who needed to be challenged, and Defiant, who needed to be warned, Drifter needed to be encouraged more than anything else. He needed a revival in his heart and a fresh reminder of why his faith in Christ mattered more than anything else in his life. Well, does that describe anyone you know? Uh, does that describe you at this present moment? I think many of us can perhaps identify with dragging if we haven't been able to identify with drifter or defiant. And as you get into Hebrews chapter 6, the later part of the chapter, after several chapters of strong warning, the writer of the Hebrews then moves to more hopeful words and I think a more hopeful tone. He moves toward encouragement. I mean, as you read chapters 1 through 5, it is one stern warning after another of falling away, of coming short. In chapter 6 at verse 1, he's speaking to people that instead of drifting, instead of falling, he says, we would rather you be moving forward into maturity. But we need to go back and reestablish some first principles all over again with you. He doesn't want people to get to that point where they throw in the towel, where they quit altogether and forfeit what God has in store for them. So with a more hopeful tone speaking to those who were perhaps spiritually dragging more than anything else, here's what he says starting at verse 9 of chapter 6. Read with me. Even though we speak like this, dear friends, we are convinced of better things in your case, the things that have to do with salvation. God is not unjust. He will not forget your work and the love you've shown Him as you've helped his people, and continue to help them. We want each of you to show this same diligence to the very end so that your hope may be fully realized or what you hope for may be fully realized. We do not want you to become lazy, but to imitate those who through faith and patience inherit what has been promised. So as you read in this particular text, notice, after issuing all these strong warnings, he says, even though we speak like this, maybe, maybe the Hebrew writer is thinking at this particular moment, perhaps my tone and my words have been a little bit harsh and strong, and maybe my words have kind of put them back on their heels just a bit. It's as if he then pauses to affirm them just a bit and say, he says, we are convinced of better things in your case. The things that have to do with salvation. Now, why is he so convinced of better things in their case? Well, probably, probably because the people that he's writing have had a great track record of commitment and service. When you read the letter and see some of the things he says about these early recipients of the letter... They have been on fire, and they have been hard workers and diligent servants for Christ. And so he, he says, in effect, we're convinced of better things 
And God, you know, is not unjust. He's not going to forget your work and the love you've shown Him as you've helped His people. And as you continue to help them, they've not dropped out altogether. They're still serving. Sometimes when when we're discouraged, though, we might come to places where we think that God has forgotten our service. Some people may forget our service, but the Hebrew writer is saying God never does. He remembers your service. And, And then notice quickly the connection between showing love to God's people and loving God in verse 10. One of the ways that we show God love is by loving His people. And these people have had a long history of loving one another. Their love for God has been evident by the way they have treated one another. As you go back to chapter 10, listen to this, starting at verse 32, just to get a sense of these early Christians and their commitment. He said, remember those earlier days after you had received the light when you endured in a great conflict full of suffering. Sometimes you were publicly exposed to insult and persecution. At other times you stood side by side with those who were so treated. You suffered along with those in prison and joyfully accepted the confiscation of your property because you knew that you yourselves had better and lasting possessions. So, do not throw away your confidence. It will be richly rewarded. You know, so as you look at these early recipients, these weren't Christians who got baptized and just sat on a pew somewhere and just waited for the second coming. These were people with deep commitments both to God and to one another. They were willing to suffer for their faith. They were willing to suffer for one another. They were even willing to joyfully accept the confiscation of their property and sit side by side with those who had been In prison, it's amazing commitment. And with that background in mind, what the writer does is the writer then comes alongside these believers and he's a little bit less preacher and a little bit more coach. He is saying, listen, with that in mind, keep pressing on. This is no time to quit. It's no time to get sluggish or listless in your faith. You are closer to the finish line than you were when you started. Keep pushing forward. Show the same diligence in your service to Christ as you did in those early days when for you it was all brand new. Stay at it. Because by faith and patience and persistence you will inherit what has been promised. And look around, imitate those who not only started well, but imitate those who persevered, who had more than a flash-in-the-pan faith, who kept securely anchored to their convictions and to their beliefs because that enabled them to hold on when they might have been tempted to let go. Imitate those who crossed, crossed the finish line well. He says there at verse 12, we do not want you to become lazy. That is a challenge for me. It's probably a challenge for you to never get to a place where we kind of rest on the laurels of our past and say, well, now maybe it's time to coast and let the younger generation serve. No, he is speaking to the whole body, young and old, saying, don't get lazy. Persistently serve God as you did At the very beginning. What a challenging statement. Now Hebrews chapters 3 and 4 are filled with examples of people whose faith failed because they gave up. They gave up on the future. They failed to hold on to the promises of God. You move forward into Hebrews chapter 11 and it's filled with the examples of individuals who had faith in God's promises and they had hope. And they finished well. And it's as if the writer is taking us back to chapters 3 and 4 and saying there were those who came short, there were those who lost their hope, who didn't maintain their faith, and they didn't enter God's rest. And he looks back to the Old Testament at those who came out of Egyptian slavery, were led across the Red Sea, went into the wilderness, and then when they sent spies into the land of Canaan, 
to bring back a report to the people of God, ten of the twelve spies who went came back with a faithless report. They didn't have enough trust and belief and confidence in God to say, we can take this land. They didn't have to do it by their own power and strength. The God of heaven was giving them possession of the land, but they didn't have enough trust and confidence in Him. And many of that generation died in the wilderness, having never entered the rest of God. But on the other hand, there were a few who did. I want to call to mind as I think about this idea of not getting lazy and finishing well, I want to call to mind a character that is not mentioned specifically in Hebrews chapter 11. He's probably mentioned generally among many who had faith, but he's a model of what it is to have faith to the end, to put your hope in a future promise and to not get lazy in the meantime, to maintain that same diligence. And I'm thinking about an older man by the name of Caleb. He's a little bit in the shadow of Joshua, right? He was one of the two spies who returned when he went into the promised land, who came back and said, we certainly can take the land. The God of heaven is giving it to us. And instead of bringing back a faithless report to the people of God, he with great courage and confidence in God said, we can do it. But he was outnumbered. And so Caleb, along with Joshua, wanders in the wilderness for 40 years until that generation dies out. And then in Joshua chapter 14, as Joshua has led the people of God into the promised land to take possession They come to Caleb in Joshua chapter 14. And as you read at verse 6, here's what it says. Listen to this carefully. I didn't pull this on the screen because I added this to the sermon early this morning, all right? That's the preacher's prerogative. A little last minute edit. But in Joshua chapter 14 at verse 6, it says, Now the people of Judah approached Joshua at Gilgal, and Caleb, son of Jephunneh, the Kenizzite, said to him, You know what the Lord said to Moses, the man of God at Kadesh Barnea, about you and me. I was 40 years old when Moses, the servant of the Lord, sent me from Kadesh Barnea to explore the land, and I brought him back a report according to my convictions. But my fellow Israelites who went up with me and made the hearts of the people melt in fear, I, however, followed the Lord my God wholeheartedly, so... On that day, Moses swore to me, the land on which your feet have walked will be your inheritance and that of your children forever, because you have followed the Lord wholeheartedly. Now listen to Caleb here, especially those of you uh, that are north of 70 or 80 years of age. Verse 10, now then, just as the Lord promised, he has kept me alive for 45 years since the time he said to Moses. So he is now 85 years of age. While Israel moved about in the wilderness, so here I am today, 85 years old, I am still as strong today as the day Moses sent me out. I am just as vigorous to go out to battle now as I was then. Now, give me this hill country that the Lord promised me that day. You yourself heard then that the Anakites were there and their cities were large and fortified, but the Lord helping me, I will drive them out just as he said. Those are the words of an 85-year-old man who 45 years later is serving as wholeheartedly and with as much vigor and zeal for the purposes of God as he did at 40 years of age. If you want an example of what Hebrews chapter 6 verses 9 to 12 looks like, it's Caleb. There is no point in our life where we retire from the work of God. There is no time in our life where we just, you know, buy a Winnebago and travel the country for the rest of our lives and forget service to the King of Kings. We need to be in it to the end. So, with Caleb in mind, with this thought of zeal to the end, with this thought of renewal, what does it take then to revive tired faith? Because I believe I'm speaking to some here this morning who may be in need of renewal and revival spiritually. Maybe the newness for you has worn off just a bit and you find yourself in the shoes of dragging 
just a bit. Well, three things that I want us to think about. And if I was rewriting the whole sermon, I'd have four points this morning instead of three. But that would probably be too long. The first point would be remember the people of God because he says imitate those who have done this well. And you and I know that there are biblical characters like Caleb who started well and finished well, and you know as well there are people in your own life spiritually who you can look back on who are now long gone but who were models of faith for you in your youth. They started well and they finished well. I have those in my life, as do you. The writer says, imitate those who persevered, who endured, who remained anchored. So go ahead and write that in the margins as point one. All right, Remember those people. Imitate their faith. But then there are three other things just quickly that the writer says, and then we'll close this series out. In order to revive faith that is tired, we need to remember God's promise. And the guarantee of that promise. Notice at verse 13 down to verse 15, the writer said, now keep in mind here, that that the letter of Hebrews is saying, just in a nutshell, those people didn't enter their rest because they lacked faith. They fell short. Then number two, as you get into chapter 4, there is still yet a rest for the people of God. Even though another generation entered into Canaan, there is another rest that God has in mind that is a promise made to us. And he says, you can trust God's promise. Notice verse 13, when God made his promise to Abraham, since there was no one greater for him to swear by, He swore by himself, saying, I will surely bless you and give you many descendants. And so after waiting patiently, Abraham received what was promised. Perhaps some of the most tragic words in Scripture are those that we'll probably hear read at some point during the Easter season. It was the words of those disciples on the road to Emmaus that Jesus caught up with. On that walk, they were discouraged. They seemed to be dejected. They said in Luke 24 at verse 41, we had hoped that he was the one who would redeem Israel. Weariness sets in when you have hopes and dreams that end up in disappointment. A weary church and a weary Christian won't survive if he or she believes they're involved in a lost cause. And I think we're in a time in Christianity, at least in our country, and in many churches of great discouragement and disappointment. And here's the deal. If you lose your ultimate hope because you get discouraged, you'll throw in the towel. I speak with a lot of weary, discouraged Christians today. They look around at the seeming decline in American churches. They see some of their own friends who have given up on their faith, kind of settled back into the world. They sense that there is this increasing hostility by some toward their faith. They've seen marriages and families breaking up. They recall what they believe to have been better days in the life of the church when churches were stronger and the influence of the church seemed to be more widespread in their communities and they wonder, what does the future hold? You know, is living for Christ a losing proposition? Is it all that we thought it was cracked up to be? Or maybe they've suffered some setbacks in their life or they've been surprised by suffering that has come to their life that they never expected and they wonder, does God really see into my life? Does He really care about my suffering? I've lived all these years for Jesus only to come to a place where I'm encountering such hardship. You see, it's easy for difficulties, suffering, and disappointment to cause people to say, you know, we'd hope. Oh, we'd hoped. But maybe maybe we were wrong. Maybe it's better to just kind of try and enjoy life in the here and now and quit living as if we have something to hope for in the future. 
That was in part Israel's problem in the wilderness. The spies entered the land, they'd been led out of slavery, and then these discouraging ten men come back with a report that suggests that the people in the land are bigger than God. They're stronger, they're more powerful. We can't trust God. The people there are too great. We'll look like grasshoppers in their eyes. And so they got discouraged, they lost their faith, they lost their hope, and they didn't enter the rest of God. And in the same way the Hebrew writer is saying, don't get discouraged. You'll suffer disappointments, but don't let your disappointments make you believe that God's promises aren't sure. Look at Abraham. Abraham was a man who had a promise made to him way back here, and then it was many years later that God fulfilled the promise. And then finally, after the boy is born and he's growing, God in Genesis chapter 22 takes him and says, listen, I want you to go up on Mount Moriah and sacrifice that boy. And Abraham in faith makes that long walk up the mountain puts his boy on the altar to sacrifice him and rears back to put the knife through him and the Lord steps in and stops him and provides another sacrifice. Abraham, patiently, after many years of waiting for the boy to be born, gets the child and then he's told to kill the child. But you see, Abraham had enough faith that God had made a promise. And God's promise was not only will you have a son, but through that son all nations of the earth one day will be blessed. So Abraham reckoned, if that's true, somehow Isaac and I are going to walk down that mountain and that boy will be alive, even if God has to bring him back from the dead. My trust and confidence is so great. And so up there on the mountain in Genesis 22 at verse 16, God said, I swear by Myself that He would fulfill that promise. And what the Hebrew writer is saying is, remember Abraham. Sometimes life here seems long, and we get weary, and we get discouraged, and we might wonder, how is God going to fulfill His promise? But keep trusting God. Have confidence in the promise of God. And even though at times we look around in our culture and we say things look bleak, Trust the promises of God. And do as it says in chapter 4 at verse 1, Therefore, since the promise of entering His rest still stands, let us be careful that none of you have fallen short of it. They had the promise of the promised land, and yet in Hebrews 8 at verse 6 it says, Our faith and confidence and hope is in better promises than those. So you want to enter that rest. There's an age to come. In the here and now, you can rest in the Lord Jesus, confident that your salvation is secure in Jesus Christ, that He paid the price. Come to Me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you what? Rest. But then there's the age to come. There's there's that heavenly city that we long for. And the Hebrew writer is saying, hang on, when God makes a promise, He keeps His promise. And that leads us, number two, to this, remember God's character. If He makes a promise, notice verse 16, people swear by someone greater than themselves, and the oath confirms what is said and puts an end to all argument, because God wanted to make the unchanging nature of His purpose very clear to the heirs of what was promised, He confirmed it with an oath. God did this so that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have fled to take hold of the hope set before us may be greatly encouraged. The writer is saying in a court of law, you might put your hand on a Bible and say, so help me God, these words are true. An oath is made to guarantee the the words of the ones making a pledge or a vow or swearing an oath. And the writer is saying we basically say that in a courtroom, I swear to God, because we're going from the greater to the lesser. We're saying in effect, I am staking this on the God of heaven that it's true. And he's saying since God has nobody higher than himself to swear by, he swears by himself. 
His own character and faithfulness is enough proof for you and me to take that as a guarantee. And his faithfulness has been proven over and over again. By the way, if you're ever on a game show, and the question is, is anything impossible for God? You can say, ooh, ooh, I know the answer. You buzz in quick. Because there is something that's impossible for God. The writer says here, it is impossible for God to a lie. First Samuel 15, 29, Samuel said to Saul, He who is the glory of Israel does not lie or change his mind, for he is not a human being that he should change his mind. And so sometimes we struggle with doubts and we wonder, am I really forgiven? If I confess and repent, will God really give me a new start? Uh, Is there really a heavenly home in the end? And Is what I'm living for really a guarantee or will I get to the end and it's all for nothing? Whatever the promise, the writer says you you can stake your life on God's character, His truthfulness. He will save you. He will forgive you. He will strengthen you. He will never leave you or forsake you. And then finally, remember God's Son. We'll end it with this. Verse 19, we have this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. It enters the sanctuary, the inner sanctuary behind the curtain where our forerunner Jesus has entered on our behalf. He has become a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. Now, I won't get started on Melchizedek, or we'll be here all day, but read chapter 7, and and let let it just suffice to say that Jesus, our high priest, is in heaven interceding for us, and he's our forerunner, who has already gone into heaven, who has already entered into the inner sanctuary, who is right now at the right hand of God, and he lived this life, and lived the righteous life that we could never live, went to the cross and bore our sin... And our sins have been placed on Him and we have been given the righteous life that He lived. And then He ascended to be with the Father. And Hebrews 7.25, as we said a few weeks ago, He ministers there for us now, constantly interceding on our behalf so that every weakness and failing is taken to God by Jesus on our behalf. Isn't that a wonderful promise? The writer of Hebrews several times says, fix your eyes on Jesus. This is the amazing anchor. By the way, isn't it interesting, the anchor, usually we think of an anchor going downward into the ocean, this anchor goes upward into heaven, as if it's pulling us along. An anchor is a great symbol, by the way. It was popular among the early Christians, although the term is found only here in Hebrews regarding our faith. But in the catacombs, they found 66 pictures of anchors. Why? Because even in times of great persecution, they put their eyes on Jesus. And they knew that Jesus was in heaven, ever faithful, interceding, and that he would see them through. So if your faith is tired, if you've been dragging just a bit, a little listless, a little lazy spiritually, let that fire get fanned into flame again. Fix your thoughts on God's promises, His character, and don't come short of entering His rest. Let's stand and let's worship and let's praise Him one more time before we get away.